Hello, and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast titled Motor Neurone Size Dependent Mechanisms of Neuroplasticity Following Spinal Cord Injury. My name is Jay Shan Carpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Advanced Cell Diagnostics. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Sabia Rana of Mayo Clinic and Dr. Courtney Anderson of Advanced Cell Diagnostics. We'll then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now over to Sabia. Hello to all tuning in. And thank you for the introduction, Jason. I'd also like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present my work with you all today. My name is Sabia Rana, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Gary Seek and Dr. Carlos Mantia at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Our lab has long been interested in the neuromotor control of breathing and the impact of disease states like spinal cord injury and aging on diaphragm function. Today, I will briefly discuss how we have employed fluorescent in situ hybridization technology on the RNA scope platform to study heterogeneity in motor neuron properties as well as to study differences in cellular responses within a defined motor neuron pool following a mid-cervical spinal cord injury. Let me start by briefly reviewing the neuromotor control of breathing. Indeed, breathing is essential to life. It seems so simple, yet taking a breath is a complex motor function that relies on the exquisite coordinated neural activation of a number of skeletal muscles. The diaphragm is the main inspiratory pump muscle, and its neural activation generates a transdiaphragmatic pressure that drives air into the lungs. As you'll see in the animation here, the diaphragm muscle contracts, resulting in a negative intrathoracic pressure, allowing for air to rush into our lungs. In addition to inspiration, activation of the diaphragm muscle is necessary for expulsive behaviors, which are essential for clearing the airways and maintaining airway patency. A greater degree of diaphragm contraction also results in greater positive intra-abdominal pressure, therefore facilitating expulsive and valve salva maneuvers. The diaphragm muscle also contributes to non-respiratory activity such as swallowing and vocalization. In evolution, the diaphragm muscle is unique to mammals, and its physiological importance cannot be argued. In all skeletal muscles, including the diaphragm, the final common output of neural control is the motor unit. In the early 20th century, Charles Sherrington coined the term motor unit that comprises the motor neuron and the muscle fiber it innervates. When the motor neuron is activated, the resulting action potential propagates along axonal branches to activate all muscle fibers of the motor unit in an all or none fashion. The motor neuron comprising the motor unit is central to our talk today. The diaphragm muscle is a mixed muscle comprising of all motor unit types. Properties of motor units underlie the diverse motor response observed within a muscle group. Recruitment of motor units also provides functional limits on the range of motor tasks that can be accomplished in response to varying mechanical demands imposed on the system. Importantly, properties of muscle fibers within a motor unit are similar. Four main types of motor units are found in the diaphragm muscle and are shown here. Differences across motor units, particularly in the contractile and fatigue properties, are widely used to define motor unit types, such that on one end of the spectrum, on our left, we have motor units comprising smaller sized motor neurons that tend to confer slow twitch but fatigue resistant properties to the muscle fibers. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have much larger motor neurons that confer fast twitch and fast fatigability to their muscle fibers. Motor unit properties are optimized to their activation history such that the most fatigue resistant type S and FR motor units are recruited first and more often than more fatigable type F intermediate and FF motor units, which are capable of generating greater forces. In the 1960s, seminal work by Elwood Henneman established the size principle that is generally believed to be the underlying mechanism of orderly recruitment of motor units. According to the size principle, the activation of smaller motor neurons for a given synaptic input to the motor pool is governed primarily by somal surface area. Like all cells, motor neurons consist of a lipid bilayer that separates ions from the extracellular and the intracellular space, the membrane acting as an electrical insulator that allows for charge separation. 
Motor neurons with a smaller surface area render a lower capacitance to their system, while those with larger motor neurons have a larger capacitance. The activation of a motor neuron is a dynamic process and requires a change in membrane potential across the lipid bilayer. The excitability of a motor neuron is reflected in the rate of change of membrane potential for a given amount of synaptic input across the capacitor, or the motor neuron membrane. This relationship is shown in the equation here. In effect, for a given amount of distributed presynaptic current, smaller motor neurons with lower capacitance will result in a larger voltage change and be more excitable. Alternatively, Smaller motor neurons require a smaller amount of current to reach the same voltage change compared to larger motor neurons. Now the diaphragm muscle accomplishes a range of motor behaviors that require varying amounts of force. To define some of these behaviors, eupneic breathing is quiet breathing, hypoxic hypercapnic breathing is challenge breathing with an exposure to a mixture of 10% O2 and 5% CO2, occlusion refers to gasps, taken when the trachea or airway is occluded, and sneezing is induced by intranasal delivery of capsaicin, the active ingredient in hot peppers. In our lab, a model of diaphragm motor unit recruitment was formulated in the rat diaphragm muscle, wherein the force contributed by different motor unit types was estimated based on measurements of specific force, the cross-sectional area, the proportion of different fiber types, and the assumption of comparable innervation ratios across motor unit types. In the line graph before us, the motor unit pool is denoted on the x-axis. On the y-axis, transdiaphragmatic pressure is presented normalized to the maximal forces obtained during bilateral phrenic nerve stimulation. The horizontal blue bars thus represent the range of pressures generated during eupnea, exposure to hypoxia hypercapnia, airway occlusion, and sneezing, which is near maximal. The solid line represents the incremental force generated by maximal orderly activation of motor units. In this model, it is evident that the forces generated during ventilatory behaviors are only 20 to 30 percent of maximal force and can be accomplished by recruitment of only fatigue resistant type S and FR motor units. These motor units likely comprise motor neurons of smaller surface area. To perform higher force expulsive behaviors, that is coughing and sneezing, the recruitment of additional F-intermediate and FF motor units is required. Based on the size principle, these motor units would likely comprise motor neurons with larger somal surface area and are recruited later in the cycle. So this recruitment model highlights the large reserve capacity of the diaphragm and the range of forces it can produce. Only about 50% of the total motor unit pool is activated during lower force quiet breathing behaviors, and a near maximal recruitment is required for higher force expulsive behaviors. So based on the size principle of motor unit recruitment, we can simplify the relationship defining motor unit activation to this equation here, where size is the main determinant of orderly recruitment of motor neurons from small to large. However, differences in presynaptic inputs and postsynaptic receptor expression, amongst many other players, would also influence motor unit excitability. So we wanted to examine differences in both presynaptic excitatory inputs and postsynaptic receptor mRNA expression across motor neurons innervating the diaphragm muscle in a size-dependent fashion. The primary excitatory synaptic input to phrenic motor neurons is glutamatergic. Phrenic motor neurons express different types of glutamatergic receptors, including ionotropic AMPA and NMDA receptors. Seminal studies in the 1980s used in vitro brain and spinal cord preps in neonate rats that spontaneously generate rhythmic respiratory drive to spinal motor neurons to examine the effect of pharmacological agents on spinal motor neuron activity without perturbing the activity of bubble spinal neurons transmitting the respiratory drive. In the graph below, the amplitude of spontaneous motor discharge in spinal ventral roots containing phrenic motor axons was reduced in a dose-dependent manner by antagonists to excitatory amino acids acting at NMDA and non-NMDA glutamatergic receptors. Ionotropic receptors facilitate fast neurotransmission at motor neurons and have been known to play an important role in neuroplasticity at the motor neuron level. So to assess glutamatergic synaptic innervation at phrenic motor neurons in the rat spinal cord, 
we injected a monosynaptic retrograde tracer. Cholerotoxin subunit B conjugated with Alexa Fluor 488 into the intrapleural space. This tracer binds to GM1 gangliosides along the phrenic nerve and at neuromuscular junctions. It is internalized into lipid rafts and transported retrogradely to the motor neuron soma located in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. This video here shows bilateral labeling of phrenic motor neurons in a rat spinal cord. Phrenic motor neurons are located from cervical level 3 to 6 in rats. You can also appreciate that phrenic motor neurons of varying sizes are clustered and intermingled all along the rostrocaudal axis. Reliable labeling of phrenic motor neurons allows us to do a cell type specific analysis. We then designed a robust confocal imaging based technique that utilizes semi-automated processing to identify presynaptic glutamatergic terminals within a defined distance around the somal membrane of phrenic motor neurons of varying sizes. Briefly, glutamatergic terminals were labeled using VGLUT1 and VGLUT2 antibodies. A macro was developed to threshold the CTB channel in each optical slice and to render a region of interest around the phrenic motor neuron soma. This region of interest was dilated by 2.5 microns in the 594 channel corresponding to the VGLUT signal. This was repeated for each optical slice and following deconvolution of the signal, 3D reconstructions were made for the phrenic motor neuron soma and terminals at the membrane. You can appreciate in the image on the bottom left that we started with the phrenic motor neuron in a sea of VGLUT terminals and were able to isolate those around its soma. The scatter plot here shows the VGLUT terminal density on the y-axis plotted against phrenic motor neurons of small to large somal surface area on the x-axis. VGLUT terminal density was negatively correlated with phrenic somal surface area and would suggest that smaller phrenic motor neurons receive a higher number of glutamatergic terminals per micron square. We also bin phrenic motor neurons based on size into tertials. The smallest tertial had an approximately 10% higher VGLUT terminal density compared to the largest tertial. So apart from somal surface area, excitatory inputs are also different across phrenic motor neurons of varying sizes. Next, we examine differences in glutamatergic receptor expression as assessed by mRNA expression in motor neurons in a size-dependent fashion. We use the multiplex fluorescent V1 assay to quantify differences in AMPA and NMD mRNA expression in phrenic motor neurons that were identified by retrograde labeling. A brief overview of our steps, we started with intrapleural injections of CTB488 three days before the terminal time point. Spinal cords were then collected in an RNAs free prep and flash frozen. The spinal cords were sectioned at 10 microns and stored at negative 80 degrees until further use. Following the RNA scope assay, we imaged sections within three to four days. The probes used for the image here are listed below. In blue, we have CTB signal that has been pseudo-colored for clarity. NMD mRNA for the obligatory subunit NR1 is in green, and AMPA mRNA for the GLUR2 subunit is in red. We then used an intensity-based analysis to quantify total mRNA expression across phrenic motor neurons of varying sizes. Quantitative analysis of mRNA transcripts in individually identified motor neurons was performed on the Fiji platform. Within a selected motor neuron, mRNA transcripts were clearly visible as puncta of varying sizes and intensity. For each individual slide, the integrated fluorescence intensities an area of 20 discreetly identifiable and clearly unclustered puncta were measured in order to define mRNA transcript. After background subtraction, the average intensity per puncta was obtained and equated to one mRNA transcript. To quantify the number of mRNA puncta transcripts per cell, a region of interest around the phrenic motor neuron soma was drawn using the outline from the CTB image. The area of each phrenic motor neuron cell body was measured. The region of interest was then superimposed on the image for the other fluorescence channels, such that the integrated intensity was measured separately for each mRNA transcript.
A useful resource for quantification of fluorescence mRNA signal is available on the ACD Bio website, and I've listed the SOP for this in the bottom left corner. So with the manual fluorescent V1 assay, we can test up to three target probes in the same cells. However, since the CTV48 signal limits us to two channels, we also tested the possibility of using immunohistochemistry to label unconjugated CTB tracer, which is shown here in blue using an antibody, and in red using CTP conjugated with Alexa 555. This design resulted in reliable labeling of our target mRNA, which is shown here in green and gray, without compromising the signal. This prep would also allow us to test up to three target probes in labeled phrenic motor neurons. So using retrogradely labeled phrenic motor neurons, we quantified both AMPA and NMD mRNA in a size-dependent fashion. Here we have the mRNA density as normalized to phrenic motor neuron somal volume on the y-axis plotted against phrenic motor neuron size on the x-axis. Here each point corresponds to the mRNA transcript density in one phrenic motor neuron. We observed a strong negative correlation with smaller phrenic motor neurons showing a much higher density of both AMPA and NMD mRNA. We then separated phrenic motor neurons into tertials for each animal to assess postsynaptic receptor mRNA expression. These groups should reflect proportional composition of different types of motor units that would be recruited to accomplish a range of motor behaviors. So phrenic motor neurons in the lower tertial would comprise motor units that are activated during lower forest ventilatory behaviors followed by the middle tertial motor neurons that are activated to accomplish higher force ventilatory behaviors, and the upper tertial of motor neurons likely comprise motor units recruited to accomplish higher force expulsive behaviors. For both NMD in red and AMPA in blue, we observed that phrenic motor neurons in the middle and upper tertial had considerably lower densities of mRNA expression as compared to phrenic motor neurons in the lower tertial. We also performed mRNA transcript density analysis by somal compartment of the motor neurons. In red, we have mRNA density in the nuclear compartment with a very weak negative correlation to motor neuron size for both NMD and AMPA mRNA. The cytosolic compartment, on the other hand, showed a stronger negative correlation to phrenic motor neuron somal size. These results would suggest that differences in mRNA density observed based on size are also reflected in the amount of mRNA that has been translocated to the somal cytosolic compartment for translation and could facilitate greater numbers of glutamatergic receptor expression in smaller phrenic motor neurons. So in summary, we found a greater expression to both NMDA and AMPA mRNA expression in phrenic motor neurons based on size. This matches closely with the orderly recruitment model for motor units. Looking back at the equation, these results would suggest that in addition to size, differences in receptor expression across small and large phrenic motor neurons could also subserve differences in motor neuron excitability. So in the second part of my talk, I want to discuss how we are using RNA scope technology to examine changes in glutamatergic receptor mRNA expression in experimental models of spinal cord injury. Nearly 17,000 new cases of spinal cord injuries are added to the patient population in the U.S. each year. Um, more than 50% of these injuries occur at the cervical level and result in significant motor impairment. Subsequently, a proportion of these patients are unable to maintain adequate ventilation and become dependent on mechanical ventilators, a situation that is associated with ongoing problems with pulmonary clearance, infections, and lung injury, eventually leading to significant morbidity. However, most cervical spinal cord injuries are incomplete, involving partial disruption of descending premotor excitatory drive from the medulla to the phrenic motor neuron pool, thereby causing complete or partial diaphragm paralysis. In humans subjected to high cervical spinal cord injuries, variable degrees of respiratory recovery have been observed in the months and years following initial trauma. Nonetheless, these spontaneously occurring improvements are often suboptimal, and the underlying substrate for this recovery is still undetermined. So I would like to briefly revisit the neural control of diaphragm muscle. Central pattern generators that sustain automatic breathing are located in the brainstem, in the medulla, and they send rhythmic signals to premotor neurons 
that are also located in the brainstem. These premotor neurons then send primarily monosynaptic ipsilateral projections to the phrenic motor neurons that are located in cervical segments C3 to C5 in the spinal cord. Phrenic motor neurons then send projections through the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm muscle that's located peripherally. Contrastingly, in locomotor system, the pattern generators and premotor neurons are often located in the spinal cord. And following injury, although descending input from the cortex might be disrupted, local pattern generators and connections could still be intact and could confound results of motor recovery. In the respiratory motor circuit, the spatial distance between the medullary pattern generators and motor neurons often result in disruption of the descending input to the motor neurons, but the pattern generators themselves and the premotor neurons are largely intact. So it's well established that the excitatory premotor drive to phrenic motor neurons is predominantly ipsilateral. In addition, there are latent but weak contralateral excitatory premotor inputs to phrenic motor neurons. Our studies consist of a unilateral hemisection model that involves the anterolateral funiculi at cervical level 2. To measure diaphragm EMG activity in our animals, we thread bilateral chronic EMG electrodes into the diaphragm and externalize them. This allows us to do repeated measures of diaphragm EMG activity analysis. So at the start of each experiment, we collect pre-injury diaphragm EMG activity. Following C2 hemisection, absence of ipsilateral diaphragm EMG activity during eupneic behaviors is also confirmed at three days post-injury. This allows us to standardize injury across animals. Following cervical spinal cord hemisection at C2, ipsilateral excitatory input is removed and rhythmic diaphragm EMG activity disappears. At 14 days post hemisection, a subset of animals display restored diaphragm EMG activity, however, at a smaller amplitude. It's possible that excitatory premotor inputs from the contralateral side can be strengthened with time after SH, leading to a functional restoration of rhythmic diaphragm EMG activity. This kind of neuroplasticity is the main area of investigation in our laboratory at the time. So as expected, following a C2 hemisection, we observe complete abolishment of diaphragm EMG activity during eupneic breathing and during hypoxic hypercapnic breathing. As a reminder, these lower force ventilatory behaviors would be accomplished by recruiting type S and FR motor units that would comprise smaller motor neurons. Interestingly, when assessing the impact of unilateral C2SH injury on higher force behaviors, like breathing against an occluded airway and sigh, we found that there is little to no impact on diaphragm EMG activity during these behaviors following the C2 hemisection injury. This key observation led us to investigate whether there is heterogeneity in the impact of an incomplete injury on phrenic motor neuron activation following unilateral C2SH that disrupts presumably the main excitatory descending inputs from the medulla to the phrenic motor neuron pool. We have previously examined mRNA expression of glutamatergic receptor expression using RT-PCR in laser capture microdissected phrenic motor neurons. Although there was no change in AMPA mRNA, we observed a decrease in NMD mRNA expression in phrenic motor neurons following C2 hemisection that progressively recover to pre-injury levels over the course of 21 days. When stratified by recovery, we saw higher expression of NMD mRNA in animals displaying spontaneous recovery. Taking into account the observed differential impact of C2 hemisection on diaphragm motor functions, it is important to explore impact of the injury on various motor neurons within a defined motor neuron pool. The current experimental prep from the LCM dissected motor neurons limits us to do a size-dependent analysis, which is circumvented by using the RNA scope platform. In the images here, we have phrenic motor neurons of varying sizes that were identified by CTB labeling. Motor neurons have been outlined for clarity. In green, we see puncta for NMD mRNA localized within phrenic motor neurons. We then quantify changes in mRNA expression across phrenic motor neurons at three days post-injury, a time point where we see complete absence of diaphragm activation during eupneic breathing 
on the ipsilateral side and at 21 days post-SH, a time point that's been associated with spontaneous recovery of diaphragm activation. In the scatter plot here, we have mRNA transcript density as normalized to phrenic motor neuron somal surface volume presented on the y-axis, plotted against phrenic motor neuron somal surface area on the x-axis. In general, there was a higher density of NMD mRNA expression in small phrenic motor neurons compared to large motor neurons in control rats. At three days post-injury, a time point where we see complete diaphragm inactivity during eupneic breathing, there is a profound reduction in NMD mRNA expression in smaller phrenic motor neurons. At 21 days SH, a time point associated with spontaneous recovery, we see a normalization of NMD mRNA expression back to pre-injury levels on the ipsilateral side of injury. We then classified phrenic motor neurons into tertials based on their somal surface area size distribution and summarized mRNA expression within these tertials. We observed the largest impact of C2SH injury in phrenic motor neurons of the lower tertials at three days post-SH, and no significant impact on phrenic motor neuron NMD mRNA expression in motor neurons in the upper tertial. At 21 days SH, there was a normalization of mRNA levels back to pre-injury levels, suggesting NMD receptors could be playing a role in neuroplastic mechanisms underlying spontaneous recovery at this time point. We also stratified animals based on recovery. In purple, we have NMD mRNA transcript density on the y-axis in phrenic motor neurons from animals displaying recovery of diaphragm EMG activity during eupneic breathing at 21 day SH. Animals in orange at 3 and 21 day SH showed diaphragm EMG activity that was less than 10% compared to pre-injury values and hence were unrecovered animals. When stratified by size, Phrenic motor neurons in the lower tertial showed a large increase in NMD mRNA expression compared to smaller phrenic motor neurons in unrecovered animals at 21 day SH. These results suggest a vital role for NMDA signaling in recovery of motor functions following a cervical spinal cord injury. We also quantified AMPA mRNA expression in phrenic motor neurons post C2SH. And contrast to the previous data set, we saw no impact of C2SH on AMPA mRNA expression at 3 or 21 day SH. Another target in our investigation of mechanisms and neuroplasticity at phrenic motor neurons has been BDNF TREK B signaling. Neurotrophin BDNF signals via its full length TREK B receptor in diaphragm muscle motor units. BDNF also plays an important role in neuroplasticity in a variety of neural systems. BDNF and its receptor track B are widely expressed in phrenic motor neurons. Our working hypothesis is that BDNF signaling through its track B full length receptor at phrenic motor neurons enhances recovery of rhythmic diaphragm activity after SH. This is part of a large project explaining neuroplasticity, specifically exploring the role of BDNF and track B signaling in functional recovery and remodeling of pre and postsynaptic elements at phrenic motor neurons. In previous work from our group, it was demonstrated that postsynaptic BDNF track B full length signaling promotes neuroplasticity and recovery of ventilatory related diaphragm activity after C2SH. Indeed, AV7 mediated overexpression of track B full length receptor alone in phrenic motor neurons was sufficient to enhance recovery of ventilatory related diaphragm activity as compared to upregulating both BDNF availability using mesenchymal stem cells as well as upregulating TREK B full length receptor expression in phrenic motor neurons. Using a previously described experiment to design, we assess changes in TREK B full length receptor expression at phrenic motor neurons following injury. TREK B full length mRNA expression is visualized in green in the image above, while CTB has been pseudo colored to red. On the ipsilateral side of the injury, there was no change in TREK B full length receptor expression in phrenic motor neurons at 3 days post injury. At 21 days post injury, a time point reflective of some amount of spontaneous recovery of diaphragm activity and upregulation of NMD mRNA, we saw an increase in TREK B full length mRNA expression that also had a size dependence. So, in summarizing the second part of my talk, there is a differential impact of a C2 spinal hemisection injury on diaphragm activation during different motor behaviors. 
There is heterogeneity in the impact of the C2SH injury on molecular expression of glutamatergic receptors that could subserve the differential impact on range of motor behaviors and thereafter support neuroplasticity. NMDA receptors appear to closely reflect time course of diaphragm activity during injury and play a key role in neuroplasticity at the motor neuron level. We also observe an increase in the ipsilateral expression of trek b fullent mRNA by 21 day post-SH. These changes were also predominant in smaller phrenic motor neurons and are generally similar to changes in NR1 mRNA expression at 21 day SH. So I will now pass the baton on to Courtney for the second part of today's webinar. I want to thank you all for your attention thus far, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have later on in this hour. Thanks, Sabia. And now over to Courtney. Thank you very much, Dr. Rana, for that fantastic presentation. Now I would like to discuss the RNA scope in situ hybridization technology and show how you can validate and spatially map gene expression analyses at the single cell level and in the tissue context with this technology. Complex, highly heterogeneous tissues, such as the brain, are comprised of multiple cell types and states. Precise characterization of these tissues can enable identification of new cell types, predictive biomarkers, new therapeutic strategies, and more. However, interrogation of these complex, heterogeneous tissues requires a highly sensitive, specific, and multiplex spatial approach with single cell resolution. The Arniscope technology is an ideal solution to interrogate complex tissues. It is a highly specific and sensitive method to detect RNA biomarkers in cells and tissues with morphological context at the single cell level. It consists of three parts, a unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest, a signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio, and lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules as dots. The assay allows for the spatial mapping of messenger RNA, long non-coding RNA, splice variants, and highly homologous sequences in cells and intact tissues, all of which can be visualized with either fluorescent or chromogenic labels. And the assay can be performed in a wide variety of sample types, including FFPE tissues, fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, PBMCs, and cultured cells. The two key features of the RNA scope technology are probe design and signal amplification. The oligonucleotide target-specific probes are depicted as Zs to emphasize the fact that they have two regions linked by a spacer. The bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript, while the top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. When two Zs hybridize in tandem to the target sequence, it creates a binding site upon which a preamplifier can bind and the amplification tree can be built. After the Z pairs hybridize with the target RNA, the preamplifier binds to the top of the ZZ pair. Each preamplifier can bind multiple amplifiers, and each amplifier can further bind multiple labeled probes. Labeled probes contain either a chromogenic enzyme or a fluorophore. This signal amplification strategy yields high sensitivity and allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each dot represents an individual RNA molecule that can be quantified. Background is eliminated because the signal is dependent on two Zs binding next to each other on the target sequence. If both Zs do not bind next to each other, then the preamplifier cannot form a stable hybridization and the amplification tree does not get built. Consequently, no amplification of nonspecific hybridization occurs, generating little to no background signal. A standard RNA scope probe will consist of 20 Z pairs pooled together that are designed to hybridize next to each other along a target region allowing for a tremendous amount of amplification and signal potential. However, a minimum of only three Z pairs is needed to bind to the target RNA sequence in order to generate enough signal for molecular detection. Taken together, this combination of probe design and signal amplification ensures a high signal to noise ratio. The base scope assay is another assay we offer that is based on the RNA scope technology but has specific applications. While RNA-scope is a robust assay to detect gene expression of most RNA targets, base-scope is specifically used for the detection of exon junctions, splice variants, and short target or highly homologous sequences. This is due to a more advanced amplification system that can now allow for a probe as short as 1ZZ, or targeting as few as 50 nucleotides. 
Basecope is also capable of single molecule detection and can be used to detect up to two targets simultaneously. Basecope can also be performed manually or on automated platforms. Shown here is a brief overview of the RNA Scope product line. We offer chromogenic singleplex and duplex assays, as well as multiplex fluorescent assays. We also offer fully automated assays that are compatible with both the Leica Biosystems Bond RX and Ventana Discovery instrumentation. The multiplex fluorescent assay has been the most widely used assay in the neuroscience field, as it allows for the simultaneous detection of up to four RNA targets in the same cell and can be combined with immunofluorescence for the detection of additional protein targets. The RNAscope technology has been widely applied for neuroscience research. Challenging IHC antibody targets such as GPCRs and ion channels can be overcome by looking at the RNA in situ. One can also visualize cellular activity and early immediate gene expression in a cell type specific manner with RNAscope. With the single cell resolution and multiplexing capabilities of the RNAscope assay, it is also well positioned to spatially map and confirm gene signatures identified by sequencing analyses. Lastly, the brain has the most splice variants over any other organ, contributing to the tremendous cellular heterogeneity. With the Basecope assay, one can now interrogate these splice variants in the tissue context. Here we visualize the detection of two distinct dopaminergic GPCRs, DRD1 in red and DRD2 in green, in the normal mouse striatum using the RNA scope multiplex fluorescent assay on fresh frozen tissue samples. A magnification for both cell types is shown in the insets on the right. Here you can appreciate the punctate single transcript detection. In this image of the hippocampus, you can see the detection of the GPCR cannabinoid receptor CNR1 in green, together with the DRD1 receptor shown in red. We observe cells expressing DRD1 primarily in the dentate gyrus itself and CNR1 expression in the CA area. Also on the left is a close-up showing DRD1 in the dentate gyrus, as well as the prominent expression of CNR1 in cells that are presumably interneurons. Here we visualize the simultaneous detection of three distinct opioid GPCRs in the normal mouse hippocampus using the multiplex assay. Opioid receptor mu, delta, and kappa are detected in green, red, and white, respectively. Immediate early genes are activated transiently and rapidly in response to a wide variety of cellular stimuli. They are activated at the transcriptional level in the first round of response to a stimulus, before any new proteins are synthesized. Therefore, examining these genes at the transcript level is critical to capturing their activity status, and RNA scope is ideal for this application. CFOS is an immediate early gene that is rapidly and transiently induced within 15 minutes of stimulation, and therefore is an indirect marker of neuronal activity. To detect neuronal activity in the mouse brain, we probe for CFOS, shown here in green, along with the GPCR cholinergic muscarinic receptor 3, or CHRM3, shown in red. Here we can see robust detection of CFOS in both the CA1 and CA2 regions of the hippocampus. The gastrointestinal mucosa is highly innervated by vagal afferents mediating communication between the gut and brain through GPCR ligands. However, expression and distribution of all GPCRs in vagal afferents is not known. Therefore, these authors completed a comprehensive expression profile and spatial localization of GPCRs, including novel uh, orphan receptors, uh, that were enriched in vagal afferents expressing the sodium channel NAV1.8. Since development of antibodies against GPCRs is challenging, RNA scope ish provided a valuable tool to study expression and co-localization patterns of 30 GPCRs. The red assay was used in combination with immunohistochemistry to validate RNA-seq data for GPCR expression in the sodium channel neurons. And the duplex assay was used to determine distribution of GPCRs in the mucosa or muscularis, shown here by expression of the GPCRs with either CCK1R, which is a marker for vagal afferents innervating the muscularis, or GPR65, which is a marker for vagal afferents innervating the mucosa. Ion channels are another example of difficult to target IHC molecules. In this image of the mouse hippocampus with a focus on the dentate gyrus, you can see the detection of the inwardly rectifying potassium channel KCNJ3, shown in red, together with the sodium acid sensing ion channel ASIC1, shown in green. Channelopathies are disorders caused by abnormal ion channel function in differentiated excitable tissues. Human CNS channelopathies cause a range of brain disorders, 
However, ion channel function at early stages of cerebral cortical development is not fully understood. Researchers at Harvard describe an abnormal developmental disorder of the brain known as polymicrogyria that is associated with pathogenic variants in the sodium channel gene SCN3A. They found that SCN3A variants disrupt cortical formation and oral motor function. RNA scope was utilized to show developmental regulation and cortical sublayer localization of SCN3A. Data from Allen Brain Atlas, single cell RNA seq, and RNA scope demonstrate that SCN3A is robustly expressed in human cerebral cortex during fetal gestation, but is downregulated after birth. Conversely, SCN1A is lower during gestation and upregulated after birth. In the fetal human brain, the RNA scope multiplex fluorescent V2 assay, shown here in grayscale, revealed that the highest SCN3A expression was in the cortical plate, which contains immature neurons, while the adult human cortex showed very low SCN3A expression across all cortical layers. Circular RNAs are a recently identified class of non-coding RNAs that result from the joining of the five prime end of one exon with the three prime end of another, a process termed head to tail splicing. They display tissue and developmental stage specific expression patterns and are particularly enriched in the brain, but also play a role in cancer and other diseases. However, because of their recent discovery, circ RNAs have no clear well-defined function yet. Therefore, accurate detection and localization of circ RNAs in the tissue context is a key factor to elucidate their functions. To visualize circ RNAs in situ, we designed three base scope probes, all 1ZZ in length, to detect the exon junctions specific for the circular, linear, and total RNA forms of the neurological marker DL-GAP1. One probe was designed to detect the exon 7, exon 9 junction, which is specific to the circular RNA form, another probe to detect the exon 9, exon 10 junction, which is specific to the linear RNA form, and one probe to detect the exon 7, exon 8 junction, which is common to both the circular and linear forms of DL-GAP1 RNA, which we refer to as total RNA. And here you can see very robust detection of the circ RNA form of DL-GAP1 in the CA3 region of the hippocampus from a postnatal day 30 mouse brain, as well as the linear form and total RNA. As I mentioned earlier, the brain has a tremendous amount of splice variants that contribute to its heterogeneity. Here, researchers at the NIH were interested in looking at splice variants from the ERBB4 gene, which has been associated with the risk for schizophrenia. Different functions are imparted by the distinct ERBB4 splice variants, and therefore it is critical uh, to identify the cells that express these distinct isoforms. The base scope assay was used to identify cell type specific expression of these rare splice variants in the tissue context. Shown here are the various exon junctions that were targeted by the base scope assay. To unambiguously determine the cell type specific splice variant expression, the authors used transgenic mice expressing GFP under specific promoters for either GABAergic neurons, marked by GAD, or for precursor or mature oligodendrocytes, marked by NG2 or CNP respectively. They combined IHC for GFP in addition to base scope for the splice variant detection. They found that JMA is the major isoform in oligodendrocytes, whereas JMB isoform is predominant in GABAergic neurons. The last section I'd like to discuss is the application of the RNA scope technology for spatial mapping of single cell transcriptomic data. Initiatives such as the Human Cell Atlas require assessing gene expression at the single cell level. However, current single cell transcriptomic studies utilized associated cells and result in the loss of spatial organization of the cell population in the tissue context. Confirmation at the single cell level in the tissue context and spatial mapping of single cell analyses can be obtained using assays that retain spatial organization, such as RNA scope. Researchers have incorporated RNA scope into their single cell RNA sequencing workflows to spatially map a cell atlas, visualize gene signatures of newly identified cell subtypes, classify highly heterogeneous cell types, confirm new therapeutic cell types, and also confirm publicly available data sets such as the TCGA and tabula mirrors, among many other applications. And now I'll show just a few examples of these. Recently, researchers from Sten Leiderson's lab at the Karolinska Institute created a molecular survey of the mouse nervous system. 
They analyzed 19 regions from the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and enteric nervous system by single cell RNA sequencing, totaling more than 500,000 cells, and created a taxonomy of all identified cell types, shown here on the bottom right. RNA scope was used to confirm the identity and spatial diversity of many cell types identified in this study. Here I'm showing the distribution of astrocyte cell types. RNA scope validated the distribution of the neurotransmitters SLC6A9, which was abundant in the cerebellum, and SLC6A11, which was abundant in the olfactory bulb. In addition, ISLR and GDF10 marked the local astrocytes enriched in the olfactory bulb and cerebellum. Lastly, and most strikingly, detection of MFGE8 and AGT in the tissue context by RNA scope revealed a distinct border separating the telencephalon from the diencephalon of the brain. This is another very nice study, also from the Karolinska Institute, that identified 15 molecular subtypes of glutamatergic excitatory neurons and 15 molecular subtypes of GABAergic inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord. RNA scope was used to not only validate the gene signatures of all 30 subtypes, but also to create a spatial map of these glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons in the cervical spinal cord. Lastly, I'd like to highlight this study in which authors from the NIH performed single nucleus RNA-seq to create an atlas of adult mouse spinal cord cell types and molecularly characterized 43 neuronal populations. RNA scope was used to confirm newly identified key genes from many clusters, including cluster DI1, which was marked by CACNA1E, and SYT1, as well as cluster DE5, which was marked by SNCA and NECAB1. They then leveraged this approach to identify neuronal populations that were active following a sensory and a motor behavior. RNA-scope-ish was used for the confirmation of neuronal populations that were activated, as indicated by upregulation of CFOS expression in response to formalin-induced pain sensory behavior. So in summary, RNA scope uses a unique probe design strategy to dramatically improve signal to noise ratio. We currently have greater than 15,000 probes in our catalog, but new probes can be designed and made within two weeks for any target and any species. RNA scope provides both quantitative and spatial information on your targets in the complex tissue environment at single cell resolution. The newest assay base scope can detect splicing variants and short sequences down to 50 nucleotides. And the RNA scope assays can be complemented by immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence for simultaneous RNA and protein detection on the same slide. The growth and adoption of the RNA scope technology is best exemplified by the number of peer reviewed publications. We had our first publication in 2011, and since then there have been over 2,100 peer reviewed papers published using the technology in numerous journals, including many top tier ones. And the RNA scope technology is highly relevant across multiple fields of research including neuroscience, oncology, infectious disease, and stem cells. If you would like more information on the RNA scope technology, please visit us on the web at acdbio.com or contact us at the email addresses shown here on the screen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentations, Courtney and Sabia. It is now time for the Q&A. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our first question, uh, this one's for uh, Sabia. Uh, it asks, um, can you um, examine dendritic mRNA expression? Uh, we seem to be having a slight issue with um, Savia's phone line for a moment. Maybe she's still on mute. So let me um, ask Courtney um, a question instead. Um, and this one asks Courtney, um, what is the difference between the V1 and V2 fluorescent assays? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, the main difference is that the uh, V1 assay is really designed for use with fresh frozen or fixed frozen tissues, 
uh, whereas the V2 assay is meant primarily for SFPE tissues. And the V2 assay utilizes um, opal dyes. Uh, in addition, uh, both assays can be performed manually, uh, but the V2 assay can also be performed on uh, the Leica automated uh, staining platform. Uh, so there's that option as well with the V2 assay. And um, we have another uh, question uh, for you, uh, Courtney. Uh, and this one asks, uh, what neuroscience-related probes are available for use with RNA scope? Um, I would say probably the most popular probes are for um, GPCRs, uh, such as DRD1 and DRD2, uh, since they are typically notorious for having uh, poor or um, really not truly specific antibodies. Um, in addition, um, we also offer many cell marker probes for common cell types, such as RBFOX3, GFAP, AIF1, and S100 beta. Uh, we also have markers for the glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons, VGLUT1, VGLUT2, VGAT. Um, but ACD has over uh, 13,000 catalogs already in our probe uh, catalog, so most likely we already have a probe designed for you. Uh, you can just search on our website. But in addition, uh, the ACD probe design team can design probes uh, against any target. Uh, you just have to submit your sequence or the NCBI accession number to our probe design team, uh, and they can uh, look to see what type of probe can be designed for you. Excellent. Thanks, Courtney. And let's see if um, Sabia is able to join us. Um, Sabia, um, I have a, a question here for you, and it asks, um, can you examine dendritic mRNA expression? It looks as though we're still having some issues with Sabia's phone line, so um, apologies for that, uh, viewers. Um, I will check the next question um, that hopefully we can direct towards um, Courtney. Uh, and this one asks, um, you mentioned running ISH and IHC together. Um, can you describe that in a little bit more detail? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, so you can combine the RNA scope assay with immunohistochemistry if you're doing chromogenic or immunofluorescence for any fluorescent staining. Uh, you can do this on the same section. Uh, essentially, you would do the RNA scope assay first uh, through completion and development of the signal, and then you would follow it by the blocking step of the IHC or IF protocol and then continue on with your typical IHC or IF protocol. Uh, we do recommend that you do use well-validated antibodies that you've already tested by IHC or IF alone. You know that they work well. Uh, we also recommend uh, that you uh, work with high-expressing protein targets um, and that you also check that your antibody will survive the RNA scope process. Uh, just because for RNA scope and really any issue, you need a protease step. Um, and that protease step could degrade some of your target protein. Uh, so you just want to make sure, uh, again, that you test the antibody beforehand. You have a pretty high expressing protein target, and then you can combine the two assays together. Uh, but you can also contact our support team uh, if you have any other questions on this. Perfect. Thanks, Courtney. And sort of following on from that, can the dual ISH uh, and IHC be performed on a, an automated machine? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, it's supported on both the uh, Leica Biosystems Bond RX and on the Ventana Discovery Ultra automated platforms. Perfect. Um, let's uh, see if uh, Sabia uh, is able to hear us and um, can answer a couple of questions from, from the audience here. Um, Sabia, hopefully you're on the line. Uh, and this question asks, um, can you examine dendritic mRNA expression? Right. Hello, Jason. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Hi, Sylvia. Perfect. <laughs> Back on. So um, we very well can. Uh, however, in our fresh frozen tissue prep, it's really hard to maintain tissue morphology since there is no tissue fixation during tissue collection. So I would suggest using formalin-6 paraffin embedded sections for this purpose if you're trying to look at dendritic mRNA expression. And there is a protocol on the website for both multiplex V1 and V2 fluorescent assay that can help you detect mRNA expression in um, formalin-6 paraffin embedded sections. 
Excellent. Thanks, Emma. And just a quick reminder to our live audience, you still have uh, a little bit more time to ask a question. Uh, to ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. Um, so our next question um, is for you, Sabia. Uh, and this one asks, um, do you observe any loss in signal uh, for retrograde tracers for identifying target neurons? We actually did. So we use CTB that's been conjugated with Alexa for 488, and the tracer is carried retrogradely in lipid rafts, and it's not membrane-bound. So somewhere along the permeabilization step, we loosen signal. So we've modified the protocol to a time point that reduces the permeabilization incubation time without jeopardizing mRNA signal detection. So we still get a fairly good amount of CTB48 labeling in our motor neurons for single-cell mRNA detection. Thanks, Amir. And also, our next question is for you. Uh, and this one asks, and why did you examine uh, mRNA expression instead of uh, protein expression using antibodies? So, um, glutamatergic receptors are um, they're expressed all along the motor neuron. Uh, the dendritic neural pillars actually contains about 95% of the entire surface area of the motor neuron. And it's extremely difficult to quantify receptor expression all along the motor neuron. Um, although there is evidence of local translation of mRNA, uh, it's transcribed in the nucleus, and major translation happens in the somal uh, body of the cytosol. So a much better representation of global levels of mRNA in the motor neuron in response to injury and activity can be measured using mRNA detection. Um, also, antibodies for NMD and AMPA receptors are notoriously hard to work with, so this method circumvents a lot of issues that we've faced. Thanks, Amir. And our next question is for Courtney. Uh, this one asks, uh, how many targets can you detect simultaneously? Uh, yes. So with our um, fluorescent multiplex assay, you can detect up to four, tar four targets simultaneously. Uh, and then with the base scope assay, you can detect up to two targets simultaneously. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, you can also combine uh, the assays with IHC or IF to detect additional protein targets as well. Excellent. Thanks, Courtney. And our next question is for Sabia. Uh, and this one asks, um, have you assessed the effects of, uh, of injury on glutaminergic receptor mRNA expression on the uh, collateral side of the spinal cord? Yes, um, so we have looked at the contralateral side. So since projections to the front motor neurons are primarily axolateral, um, we saw little to no effects of injury on the contralateral mRNA expression at, at a more acute time point for glutamatergic receptors. However, at chronic time points that have been associated with recovery, we observed an increase in trek full length mRNA expression contralateral to the injury, and this would be indicative of compensatory mechanisms in the spinal cord that can restore diaphragm function or any motor function, for that matter, following injury. And our next question uh, is also for you, Sabia. Uh, and this one asks, um, basically, you, you've examined um, the sort of glutaminergic um, receptors. However, they were wondering what your thoughts are on uh, potential changes in the uh, five HTRs uh, and their role in a similar setting. Uh, is that something you can help answer? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So. Uh, serotonin, uh, they're neuromodulators, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the serotonergic system in uh, the frenic neuron pool plays a prominent role in neuroplasticity and recovery. And 5-HT receptors do interact primarily with, or in a large sense, with glutamatergic receptors. So although we haven't gone down the path of looking at 5-HTR receptor expression in frenic motor neurons, um, there are various different types of 5-HT receptors that would be expressed in front of motor neurons, uh, both inhibitory and excitatory that I believe would be changing following injury and would interact with both TREC-B and the glutamatergic receptors. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Sabia. And the next question is for Courtney. Uh, and this one asks, them, how long does the RNA scope assay take to perform? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's actually... Uh, been really streamlined so that it can be done in a day. 
Um, basically, the manual chromogenic assay takes about eight hours, uh, but the fluorescence assay can actually be quite short. The V1 assay, which is used with the fresh frozen assay, uh, I'm sorry, fresh frozen tissues, uh, really can be done in as little as six hours. Um, and again, we also have the automated platforms um, on Ventana and Leica. Um, the staining takes about 12 hours, but that really is only 30 minutes of hands-on time. Um, so it's a really a fairly quick assay. Awesome. Thank you, Courtney. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. I would now like to thank Dr. Sabi Arana and Dr. Courtney Anderson for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.